I'm actually going to start where I finished in Micah chapter 4 uh, because I want to just pick up something that's very important for this, uh, this third study. The counsellor, we considered in our previous study, will need to enforce his counsel. And the reason for that is given to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, which is on the screen. We know the passage well. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. It will not be that way in the kingdom of God. There will be immediate rebuke and judgment of those that are, are wicked or evil. And history shows, of course, when evil works go unpunished, they only encourage continued rebellion and wickedness. Now, we had a look at Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. We don't really need to go back there. But what I wanted to do was to pick up something out of verse 9. You might recall I made a mention of the word counsellor in Micah chapter 4, verse 9. Is thy counsellor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman of travail, be in pain, labour to bring forth thy daughter of Zion like a woman in travail, all based upon Rachel giving birth to Benjamin. Of course, this is the story based on Jacob. And thou shalt go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. Now, so why was God going to send his people, Judah, to Babylon? Well, because they had adopted Babylonian idolatry. And the best way to get rid of the idolatry from them was to send, it to, send them to its home. And they would, they would have idolatry right in their face for 70 years until they learnt not to bow down to idols of wood and stone. He cured his people of idolatry by sending them to the home of idolatry. So what was the home of idolatry? Babylon. Who built Babylon? Nimrod. Yes, so Nimrod comes into the picture. He's involved in Israel's destiny. He has to be purged. Now, what's that got to do with our subject for this class, which is the mighty warrior? It's got a lot to do with it. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, we meet that, that phrase. So come back with me to Isaiah uh, chapter 9. We're now dealing with the third title of our Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Miracle, Counselor, and it says the Mighty God. Now this word mighty is the Hebrew word Gibor. It means powerful, strong or mighty, so the translation is pretty good. The first of 159 occurrences of Gibor in the Old Testament is used of apostates in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. So I'm going to go back to Genesis 6, verse 4, and I'm going to read it to you. This is the first time you read this word gibor in the Old Testament. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, gibor men, which were of old, men of renown. First time that the word gibor is used. First of 159 occurrences. The next three occurrences are just a little bit further on in our Bible. In Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, where three times you have this word gibor used in the context of who? Nimrod, the mighty hunter. So verses 8 and 9 of Genesis 10 say, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one, gibor, in the earth. He was a, a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Three times the word gibor is used in that passage of scripture. So it's again about rebellious apostasy. The next occurrence is in Deuteronomy 10 verse 17. And this changes the whole thing. Yahweh is the contrasting subject of Nimrod. In the next use of Gibor in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17. Not, I haven't got time to take you there, but you might want to jot it down. The word is used of our God. All five occurrences of Gibor in the book of Joshua are of warriors. Just like Nimrod was a warrior. All four occurrences of Gibor in the book of Judges are about warriors. 
Gibor is used of Christ in the scriptures prophetically in all of these places. I'm not going to read them all. There's quite a few of them. They're all prophecies about Christ, and Isaiah 9 verse 6, of course, is one of them. And the term Gibor is used of him. So I want you to come then to that passage that we've looked at twice already, Isaiah chapter 11. This is going to be, as we've seen, a filling out of what we read in chapter 9 verse 6. So in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2 we read this, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. Now this word gabura comes from gibor. Gibor is the root of this word rendered might. Signifies strength and might. It's used, this word, gabura, in Judges chapter 8 and verse 21. Now I'm not just plucking this out of the air. I'm using it deliberately because we're going to be back in Judges chapter 7 pretty soon. And we're going to see the context in which this word is used. Zeba and Salmana, just before Gideon killed them, they acknowledged Gideon's strength, his gabura. He was a mighty warrior. In Psalm 66 verse 7, we read this. He ruleth by his power, gabura, forever. The Olam, the, the, the millennial age. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. So you get a bit of a feel for the way that this word gabura is used. Its, it's, it's uh, root is gibor. So it just gives us a bit of a flavour as to what Gibor is about. It's about the strength of a warrior. So with that as a foundation, we can go back to where we find that title in Isaiah 9. So step back to Isaiah 9 with me. And we're going to start reading this in the preceding verses. Isaiah 9 and verse 4 and 5. And you have to read it carefully and you have to think about it why it says what it says. Verse 4 of Isaiah 9. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, and here's your important words, the words you can see in green, as in the day of Midian. It's a clue which must not be missed. As in the day of Midian. Where would you go? Judges chapter 7. The destruction by Gideon of the 135,000 host of the Midianites. Okay? That's where you'd go. And we're going to go there in due course, God willing. Gideon's victory over the Midianites in Judges 7 is a type of Christ's triumph at Armageddon. And Armageddon is the subject of the next verse in Isaiah 9. Verse 5. It says this, for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. It's a reference to Armageddon. Now I'm going to prove that beyond all dispute. There's no way that this can be uh, uh, overturned. It's what the scripture says. This verse is about Armageddon. And the type that is used is the, th is the overthrow of the Midianites by Gideon. Okay, next verse is verse 6, for unto us a child is born, and so on. He's going to be the mighty warrior. So Gideon is going to be the type of Christ as a mighty warrior. Now if you think that's not right, what you're going to do is turn a page to Isaiah 10. Isaiah 10, verse 24. Therefore thus saith Adonai Yahweh of armies, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. Now, this is the latter-day Assyrian. This, this is a reference to Gog of Ezekiel 38. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And Yahweh of armies shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian. Notice this. The slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oram. And as his rod was upon the sea, so she lifted up after the manner of Egypt. And uh, so it goes on. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, just to get your mind working on it. Why isn't Zeb mentioned here? Because the two kings that were overthrown in the valley of Jezreel by Gideon and his 300 faithful men were Oreb and Zeb. 
Well, the answer is pretty simple. You see, Oreb is the, is the one who is the type of Gog, whereas Zeb, which means a wolf, is a type of Gog's compatriot who doesn't happen to be on the, battle, on the field of battle that time, at that time, the papacy. The papacy will be in league with Gog in the invasion of the land, but they're not on the field of battle at that time. Okay? So Zeb's not mentioned. This is what I love about the scripture, brothers and sisters. It is so perfectly accurate. And we can have absolute confidence in it. Oreb means a raven. Ravens are known, of course, for plucking out the eyes of lambs. They have no consideration. It's about the rapacity of Gog. Zeb's not mentioned because Zeb is the representative here in the symbology of Catholicism. Their judgment comes later. This is just about Armageddon, okay? which is a relatively short period of divine judgment compared to the 40 years that follow, which will overthrow the papal nations. Now that's why we read from Psalm 83. Psalm 83 is an Armageddon psalm. I make that statement. I don't make statements without being able to prove them. So you check it out. You judge me. You, you, you be the judge on whether or not this is correct. So come along to Psalm 83. We've just seen from Isaiah two references to Midian. Guess what we're going to find in Psalm 83? The overthrow of the Midianites by Gideon. And if that is used in the, in the prophecy of Isaiah of Armageddon, which it clearly is, then why wouldn't it be the same in Psalm 83? It clearly is. How do you prove that? Well, Psalm 83 is based upon Genesis chapter 14. And this is a little thing you can follow up in your own time. Whenever you read the title Ael Aelion, which is, first occurs in Genesis 14 four times of Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. Ael Aelion. Okay? Whenever you read that in the Old Testament, and there are 48 or thereabout occurrences, the subject matter of the context you're reading comes from Genesis 14. Check it out. It always comes from Genesis 14. Now we have these two words of the title. The first one's in verse 1. Keep not thou silence, O God, that's Elohim. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O Ael. Right, different Hebrew word, Ael. Look at verse 18 of Psalm 83. That men may know that thou whose name alone is Yahweh art the most high, Aelion, E-L-Y-O-N, as you can see on the screen. So you've got the first verse and the last verse of the psalm. Give us the title. The subject matter between is all about Armageddon. Because it comes straight out of Genesis 14. So I said, first occurrence of this title is in Genesis 14, four times in the context of Armageddon. So I think what we really should do is have a very quick look at Genesis 14. I'm going to pop something in Psalm 83. We'll be back here shortly. Come back to Genesis 14. And the reason I'm going to have something in, in uh, Psalm 83 is because I want to read a few words out of it. The context of Psalm 83 verses 2 to 5 is about a confederacy of nations determined to destroy Israel. Remember how Brother Kevin read that in the, in, in, in the psalm? Verse 2, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, they, they that hate thee are lifted up. It says, the head. You know what the Hebrew should be translated as? Their Rosh. Not a name, but the word in the Hebrew is Rosh. They have lifted up their Rosh. What does that sound like to you? Ezekiel 38, verse 2. Yeah. It goes on to say this, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. You ever heard of a man called Ahmed Aminajad, who was formerly the president of Iran? You know what his policy was? As the policy of Iran is today, we're going to wipe Israel off the map. Let us cut them off from being a nation. Yeah. Verse 4 goes on to say, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against thee. Well, that's exactly the story of Genesis chapter 14. What have we got? 
Well, you know the story. We have a northern confederacy consisting of four kings. And when you look at those four kings, they actually line up with the four parts of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Did you know that? What's the head of Nebuchadnezzar's image? Babylon. Well, read it. Read Genesis 14, verse 1. Now, if I didn't like reading names, I could change this verse a little bit. I could say, for example, it came to pass in the days of these kings. Does it remind you of anything? Daniel 2, verse 44. It shall come to pass in the days of these kings that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Yeah, you know the verse. But look at the names. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Amraphel means a powerful people. Shinar is... Babylon. That's where the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel was built. It became known as Babylon. And he doesn't get involved. And Raphael doesn't come down upon the land of Israel. But he's the thinking power behind it, just like the papacy was the thinking power behind the invasion of the land of Israel in the latter days. Let's read on. Ariok, king of Elisar. You know where that is? That's where we might call Iraq and Iran is today. Elisar. Well, that's the second part of the image, isn't it? That's the Persia part, the Medo-Persian Empire. Who comes next? Kidaleoma, king of Elam, which is also a little bit to the north of Babylon. Now, Kidaleoma has a very interesting name, which you're going to see in a minute. When you compare what we've got here in Genesis 14 with Psalm 83, it's probably obvious that Psalm 83 is based on Genesis 14. In the same way that we read about Gideon's overthrow of the Midianites in Isaiah 9 verse 4, or 5, 4 was it, and Isaiah chapter 10, that's what you've got in Psalm 83. Let me read it to you again. Verse 9 of Psalm 83. Do unto them as unto the Midianites and to Sisera as to Jabin at the brook of Kishon, which perished at Endor, etc., Verse 11, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and Zalmanna. These are the four kings or four princes of Midian. So it's probably obvious, isn't it, that we have here a reference to Armageddon. And the ten nations who are listed in Psalm 83 represent all nations. Ten stands for all who come against Israel. The focus is upon peoples and nations and not upon territories in this case. So... Psalm 83, brothers and sisters, is based upon Genesis chapter 14. So what happens in Genesis 14? You've got this four-part confederacy, like the four parts of Nebuchadnezzar's image. They come down and they defeat a southern confederacy of nations in the land of Israel. Interesting, isn't it? They take away Abraham's natural brethren into captivity. What's Go going to do? Zechariah 14 take captives out of the land. Joel 3. Okay. Abraham puts together an army in Genesis 14 consisting of home-born Hebrews and converted Gentiles. And they go out and defeat this Kedaleoma. You know what his name means? A handful of sheaves. Yeah. He's destroyed in a valley in a place that wasn't known by that name at that time called Dan. He wasn't called Dan until Judges chapter 18. Okay? But it's called Dan Genesis 14. Why? Because the Spirit wants us to know that this is about Armageddon. A heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Armageddon. Now you want proof that Genesis 14 is actually about Armageddon? Here it is. This is what I love about it, Scripture. It gives you the, the imprint of the Spirit. The first place that you read the word Hebrew in your Bible is in Genesis 14, verse 13, where it says, Abram, the Hebrew, okay, puts together his army. Where's the last place you read the word Hebrew in your Bible? Revelation 16, verse 16. He gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. You can't miss that, can you? It's so obviously tied to Armageddon. So with that background, it's quite brief. If you wanted to follow up on that, we, we have a, a set of notes that we can make available with all the details of Genesis 14. 
But come back to Psalm 83 with me. Let's pick this up at verse 6. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes. Now there are ten nations here. The first of them is Edom. Why would that be the case, do you think? Well, you see, Edom, even though there are no descendants of Esau in the earth today, they're all gone. The Romans made sure of that post AD 70. They got rid of all Edomites. They're gone. The world, however, is full of Edomites. You know why? Because it's full of anti-Semites. Edom was the name given to Esau. He was the first anti-Semite. He hated his brother Jacob. He wanted to kill his brother Jacob, remember? That's what anti-Semites want to do. Let us cut them off from being a nation, they say. Yeah, so that's why God uses the term Edom. And if you wanted proof of that, you just need to go and have a look at Isaiah 34. Now, Isaiah 34 will tell you that Edom is the name that God gives to latter-day anti-Semites. Because, you see, Isaiah 34 just happens to be quoted in Revelation 14. Isaiah 34, verses 10 and 11, I think it is, no, 9 and 10, 9 and 10 of Isaiah 34 are quoted in Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. And the previous verse, verse 8, says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You know what the context is. That's why in Ezekiel 35 and 36, Edom is chosen as the name, the prophetic name that God gives to those nations who come to destroy Israel in the latter days. Why? Well, because Esau was the first anti-Semite. So who's the head of the image? Babylon. Who has destroyed more Jews in its history than any other power, including Hitler? The Catholic Church. Multiple millions of people because of what they call their blood libel. They believe Jesus, who was God to them, was killed by the Jews. They killed our God, was the call of the church. So they too should be killed. So this blood libel, which has gone on for centuries, has seen more Jews slaughtered by the Catholic system than any other power has ever done. That's why God calls them Edom. Because they're anti-Semitic. You all heard about Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, they called him. Mm. Stood, said nothing. Said nothing when six million Jews are being roasted by the Nazis. God doesn't make mistakes. And he uses the term Edom. He's doing it for a, for a deliberate purpose. So that's why Edom is the head of this group of nations. Okay, about Babylon. Who comes next? Well, the Ishmaelites, in other words, Muslims. Where are the Muslims? Well, look east from Israel. What have we got? All Muslim nations right across to India, Pakistan. They're all Muslim. Okay, And they'll be part of that confederacy because we read in Ezekiel 38 verse 5 that Persian doesn't just mean Iran. It means the, 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 the country from Syria to the Indus River in Pakistan first of that territory. They're all Muslim. Yeah, they're Ishmaelites. Get a picture? See how accurate that is? goes on to say in verse 7, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines were the inhabitants of Tyre. Well, why does it say the inhabitants of Tyre? Well, that's where the Hezbollah are. Alright? Verse 8, it says Asser in the King James. It should be Assyria. Assyria is the name given to latter-day Gog in Isaiah 10:24, 30 verse 31, 31 verse 8, and Micah 5 verse 5. Micah 5 verse 5 says, This man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. Yeah, it's latter-day prophecy. The latter-day Assyrian, of course, is Russia or Gog. And they're about to take possession of the rest of Syria which just happens to be, you know, when they take that and Iraq, just happens to be the territory of ancient Assyria. Yeah. When they got that, and they got it right across, as, as the prophecy requires, they got the territory right across to the Indus River, 
they become the king of the north, foreign occupying power of the territory of the Seleucid kingdom. Then they can take Constantinople and then they can come down upon the land. That's prophecy. Okay. So with all that as a background, let's have a look at Gideon, shall we? Gideon's triumph over Midian, which is used as a type of Armageddon, Psalm 83 verse 9 and verse 11, Isaiah 9 verse 4, Isaiah 10 26, is, it's so complete, so full, it's just awesome. There's the three stages. The work of Gideon can be divided into these three stages answering to the work of Christ. There's the first advent, that's the subject matter of chapter 6 up to verse 32 or so. It's about the sacrifice of Christ and the confirmation of the covenant made unto the fathers. It's just unbelievable what's there, brothers and sisters. But we haven't got time to do that now. The second advent of Christ is from the end of Judges chapter 6, where it speaks about the resurrection. That's where the, the, the Jews on the fleece, remember? It's on the fleece the first night, but on the, the solid ground of a threshing floor the second night. So Christ raised from the dead. Well, where did they get the fleece from? from a sacrifice. Okay. So this fleece is full of dew, symbol of the spirit, wrung out into an earthenware jar, which overflows, right? Immortality for Christ. But the second night, the second night of Gentile darkness, the resurrection of the brethren. There's no dew on the fleece. You can't raise Christ again, but you can raise his brethren. So the dew is on the threshing floor. Then you've got the judgment seat in Judges chapter 7 which is what the 300 you know, who lap like a dog's all about. You can't go into all of that. Then you've got Armageddon. I want you to come, if you would, to Judges chapter 7. So let's come back to this wonderful record in the book of Judges. I'm going to pick this up at verse 12. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number. It's the sand by the seaside for multitude. Sounds a bit like Abrahamic covenant language, doesn't it? And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. We know the story well, don't we? Well, who, what's this thing about a cake of barley bread here? Running into what's called the tent, which is, of course, the tent of the kings of the, Mid of the Midianites. Well, Gideon and his servant Fuhrer are listening to all of this go back and they round up their 300 men and away they go. Well, this cake of barley bread is very important because it's a type of Christ. Barley ripened before wheat, we know that, was used in the Passover. It was the wave loaf of the Passover. Okay. It was half the value of wheat, we find in the scripture, 2 Kings 7 1. In fact, it's described as horse's food. It's the lowest form of human consumption. Now, nobody's going to remind me that Vegemite is made out of barley, please. <coughs> it's the lowest form of human consumption, according to many Americans. Okay? Ezekiel was required to eat it as part of you know, his sign when he lay on his side for many, many days. Similarly, Christ was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 53, verse 3, though he was the bread of God sent from heaven. Okay, so you get, get a feel. This cake of barley bread which runs down the hill and smashes into the tent. The language of Daniel 11, verse 45. All right? He shall plant the tent, the tabernacle, between the seas in my glorious holy mountain. And God will think he's victorious. And Christ and the saints arrive at the Mount of Olives and kaboom! Their power is overthrown. That's the story here. It's all about Armageddon. But look at what we learn from this context. Verse 15 tells us that when Gideon and his servant heard this, they went back. What they said to their, to their 300 in verse 15 was, Arise! That's going to be the result of resurrection, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
For Yahweh hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided, verse 16, the 300 into three companies, and he put a trumpet, notice this, trumpet there is the word shofar, a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers, of earthenware jars, and lamps within the pitchers. Now that word lamps is no ordinary word for lamp. It's the word lapid. It's the word used of, of the fire of the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's the word used in Genesis 15 when Yahweh passed between the pieces of Abraham's sacrifice. Remember that? A lamp passed between. It's no ordinary lamp. We're going to see this as a divine light here, represented in the type. So you've got a shofar in the right hand, the hand of power, and you've got this empty jar with a, a lamp, a flame inside it. Well, Anybody tell me what happens if you put a, a, a lamp, like a burning rag, inside a jar? It goes out, doesn't it? Why does it go out? Well, it burns the oxygen up. Okay. So think about that when we go through this. I want you to notice something very important here. Step back with me to Judges chapter 6 and verse 16. When the angel was talking to Gideon, this is what he told him in verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Well, yeah, we know that Gideon's a type of Christ. So what does that mean? The one body of Christ. A multitude in one man. That's what we've got here. And this is what he says back in chapter 7. And we have a look at verse 17. And he said unto them, Look on me. Well, of course, that's the key, isn't it? That's the secret. We look at Christ and what he is we want to become. We want to mould ourselves on him. Look on me, he says. What does he then say in verse 17? And do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. Well, I think, do I need to explain that? I don't think I need to explain that. It's powerfully obvious, isn't it, what that means. So what about this shofar trumpet? It actually occurs, this word, it's contact eight times. Eight's the number of immortality. New beginning in immortality. It's in the right hand of power and authority. This is clearly telling us something. Now, sorry about that. Can I go back for you? Yeah. So this is clearly telling us something. I'm going to have a look at this shofar, the secret of the shofar. It's, of course, the, the horn, the ram's horn, which the Jews still use today. Significantly, the first three occurrences of this word shofar are in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20, and the giving of the law of Moses. Okay. The next occurrences are in Leviticus 25, verse 9, in the law of the Jubilee. It's twice there. Then 14 times in Joshua chapter 6. This is the first three batches of the word shofar. Note the events. Exodus 19 and 20 was about Sinai, which we know is the place of judgment for the saints. We can demonstrate it's the place of judgment for the saints. That's where our destiny is going to be determined. That's where we're going to be immortalized, brothers and sisters. The next occurrence is 20, Leviticus 25, verse 9, about the jubilee, when every man returns to his family and every man to his inheritance. So when the dead are raised and those that go to the right are changed, what's going to happen? They're going to, turn to return to their family. What's their family? Their Abrahamic family. And to their inheritance. What's their inheritance? The promise of Abraham. Given the land. A portion of the land. Yeah. What's the next occurrence, the next batch? Joshua chapter 6. And in the wonderful type of the book of Joshua. Joshua 6 is the Armageddon chapter. All right. It's the Armageddon chapter. Great earthquake undermines Jericho. So there's your pattern, you see. It's the exact pattern, exact order of events in Judges chapter 7. You've got the resurrection, the judgment seat. You've got every man returning to his family. You've got the 300 faithful represent the multitude of the saints. And the next thing is you've got the type of Armageddon, the destruction of the Midianites. So let's go back to our picture here. 
So we've got this earthenware picture over here in the left hand. Now the left hand is the hand of mortal weakness. Sorry for those who use your left hand. But it is in the Bible, the hand of mortal weakness. What have they got in this hand of mortal weakness? An earthenware jar. Well, we know what an earthenware jar means. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, says the apostle, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So this has got to be the power of God because if you put a lighted lamp, it's flame, inside of earthenware jar, it goes out. But this one didn't go out. What well, they do with it? Smashed it to reveal the divine light. That's what's going to happen. Resurrection judgment seat when you put on immortality. That's going to allow you to go forth as part of this great army destroy the Gogian confederacy when it comes down upon the land. What a marvellous type this is, eh? Yeah, it's marvellous. And when you get down to the end of Judges 7, what do you read? You read in verse 25, they took the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb, the raven, mentioned in Isaiah 10, remember, because it's a reference to Gog, and Zeb, they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and significantly, they slew Zeb upon the wine press. Yeah, it's the second phase. It's the treading out of the wine press of the wrath of God. Exactitude that's just awe inspiring in the type. So let's just summarize. Midianites, we've seen from these passages, represent the Gogian Confederacy. Only Oreb is mentioned in Isaiah 10 because it's just about Armageddon. It's not about the subsequent 40 years of conflict. The raven he is rep refers to the rapacity of Gog. Zeb the wolf represents the papacy. That's going to be, of course, the, the, the next work of Christ and the saints. So there are two phases to the divine judgments. There's the harvest. This, Revelation 14 gives us these two phases. There's the harvest of the earth. That's why we've got the word Armageddon a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And we've got the vintage, the treading out of the wine press of the wrath of God. So two phases, Armageddon, followed by 40 years of judgments against those who oppose the rule of Christ. And they will, as Psalm 2 tells us. Seems, seems ridiculous, doesn't it, that they will? Because they'll, they'll introduce and say, well, we told you, we told you in our doctrine of Antichrist that this was going to happen, see? And far too many people will believe it. So here's a summary. Gideon's triumph, a type of Christ, a sudden and unexpected attack. Compare Christ's sudden appearance at Armageddon, Zechariah 14, verse 3. Mutual slaughter destroys the enemy. What happens in Judges 7? Yeah. Mutual destruction. Victory by divine power, human prowess denied. He became judge over Israel by his victory, just as Christ will become king over Israel. And the faithful 300 participated in the victory. The brethren of Christ will share his triumph, brothers and sisters. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to take you to Psalm 149. So come along to Psalm 149. Psalm 149 begins with these words. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song. When you read about a new song, there are nine occurrences of this in Scripture. It indicates a song that can only be sung with full meaning by immortals. And we know the, we know the words of these new songs. We've got one in Revelation chapter 5. All right? They sung a new song. We actually told the words. But could you sing that song today as you will sing it tomorrow when you're immortal? Of course you can. So it's actually about a song of immortals. You can only fully appreciate it when you've left behind all the problems and difficulties of human nature. So this psalm sets out what's going to happen in the bridal chamber uh, when preparations for, a war, for war are about to begin. And we know, and I won't go into the details of this, we know, we can prove from Scripture, that the actual judgment process itself will take around 12 months. All right? We can prove that from Exodus 40. Then there will be a one-year period to fulfill Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. When a man takes a wife, he shall not go to war, he shall not be charged with any business, he will stay at home 
for 12 months and cheer up his wife. Anybody here did that? Anyone? No one in history has ever done it. But Christ will. One year of judgment, he immortalizes his bride, and for the next 12 months, there's no preparation for war. He goes around to meet individually every single member of his bride. It's going to take him 12 months to do it. He's coming to see you. Coming to see you. Then you can prepare for war. That's what Psalm 149 is about. Okay. He goes on to say in verse... It's in verse 1 about the congregate. That word congregation is quahal. It's the Old Testament equivalent for ecclesia. We know that from the Septuagint translation. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the, with the timbrel and harp. For Yahweh taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Beautify the meek with salvation. I can't go into all these details because of the time. But you know, of course, that Moses is described as the meekest of all men upon earth in Numbers 12, verse 3. It's the same word. Okay. Um, that's the first occurrence of this word, by the way, in the Old Testament. It's about Moses. Let them be joyful, it says, in glory. Uh, let them sing aloud upon their beds. Now, the bed here, of course, is not a reference to a place where you sleep. It's, it's a couch or a recliner where people can sit together, as we're doing here, but perhaps a bit more comfortably. Right? Sit together and, and chat and talk about things. It's going to be a wonderful time. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand. This is the sword of the Spirit, isn't it? Symbol for the Spirit power that they will go forth with. And they're going to bind kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honour have all his saints. It will be a great honour to be alongside the Gibor Ale, the mighty warrior, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he did say, didn't he? He did say before Pilate, in John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered when he was asked about his kingdom by Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, this order of things, this cosmos, then would my servants fight. What does that mean to you? I know what it means to me. When the time comes for his kingdom to be established, we will be alongside of him to establish it. Take Malachi 4 verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. This is a reference to Armageddon. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall, shall be stubble. You know, heap of sheaves and a valley for judgment. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith he who will become armies, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And it goes on to say this. That's clearly Armageddon. In verse 3 it says this. And ye, this is the faithful, that are referred to in Malachi 3 verse 16, who spake often one to another of the things that, that were the joy of their heart, and a record was made of them, and they'll be they're in the book of life, and their record will demonstrate that they should remain in the book of life. And this is what they're going to do. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith he who will become armies. Even Paul said in Romans 16.20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. We are going to be involved, brothers and sisters, in the establishment of the kingdom of God if we happen by the grace of God to be there. Finally, the picture we get in Revelation chapter 19. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. Again, this is what I love about the scripture. A white horse. What does white mean? What does a horse represent? We'll just read on. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. It's a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ as a mighty warrior. And in righteousness. That's what white means. Isn't it? It's the color of righteousness. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's what the horse means. But this horse just happens to be the horse of Israel. And the proof of that is Isaiah 63 verse 13. I want you to just have a quick look at that. You've got a minute. A quick look at Isaiah 63 verse 13. 
And we can read verse 12 to get the context. I want you to know how this chap notice how this chapter starts, brothers and sisters. Verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with his garments stained with blood? It's the exact language of Revelation 19, because Revelation 19, all of it is drawn from Isaiah 63. And what's he done? He's trodden out the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God, subject to Revelation chapter 19. So who's the horse here? Look at verse 12. Why Edom? Well, because it's Babylon. Verse 12, that led them, this is Israel, by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. That led them through the deep as an horse. In the wilderness, when have you ever heard of Israel being called a horse? If you had to choose a four-legged beast, a burden, as a symbol for Israel, what would it be? It would be the, the male ass, the camor, wouldn't it? But why does God use horse here? Well, because it's the foundation of Revelation chapter 19. And the horse is a symbol for war. This is a reference to Israel. Coming back to the land under Elijah. And many of the saints are going to be involved in that work of shepherding the nation of Israel back to the land. And they are going to be used as the vehicle of warfare and judgment against Babylon the Great, called in this chapter, Edom. Psalm 83. The head of the image. Got a picture? Yeah, so we can see why he's called the mighty warrior. Later on in the day, when we've recovered a little bit, you can have a look at his next title, the father of the age.